USS Yorktown CV-5 is a carrier that lives in legend. The first of her class and arguably the best designed pre-war carrier in the United States Navy. Arguably the best designed pre-war carrier, period, depending on who you ask. If Yorktown is less famous than her sister Enterprise, it is only because of stupendously poor luck. She established the legend of durability that her class would become known for. She was the first to fight on, even with damage that should have taken her out of the fight. She was the first to survive a battle against the Japanese. She very nearly survived too, in spite of damage that would have sent a lesser ship to the bottom. Yorktown is a ship that could tell many stories if she could talk, I think. I will warn you though, this is a long one. Grab a drink and hopefully sit down to learn about an underappreciated carrier. Of course, before we can get into that, I have to talk about her design process, which, as I've alluded to back in the Wasp video, was quite a drawn-out process in its own right. To understand this, one must understand the situation the USN was in at the time. They were still learning how exactly to build and operate carriers. As I've mentioned before, each time this has come up, Langley was only ever an experiment, one that did good service, but not a model for future carriers in anything but the broadest terms. Lexington and Saratoga were very capable for what they were, but they were also conversions that could never be repeated. Ranger, the first purpose-built carrier, was only just coming into service when Yorktown was laid down. So while her service didn't impact the design, the limitations to Ranger, alongside experience from the conversion carriers, were already showing themselves. As a result, the Navy would abandon the concept of building really small carriers, at least for the moment, and start looking to something bigger. This was driven, most importantly, by the complete lack of protection in Ranger. The advocates for a lot of smaller carriers that couldn't really take a hit, but gave the most flight decks, lost out to those arguing for carriers with better protection. Considering how well the Yorktowns, even the baby Yorktown Wasp included, held up to battle damage, this was a good choice, though that durability has as much to do with excellent damage control as the ship design, which still had certain flaws in the anti-torpedo protection, no matter how tough the ships proved in service. Langley had already demonstrated that smaller carriers had issues operating in rough weather, something Ranger would show in service, whereas the much bigger ex-battle cruisers had far fewer issues here though one must acknowledge that any new carrier would be substantially smaller than those conversions. The final nail in the coffin of the small carrier option would prove to be speed. When Ranger was designed, speed was considered less important than air wing size. This is why Ranger struggles to get near 30 knots while carrying quite a lot of planes. The next carriers, on the other hand, were fully intended to go up towards 32 knots in speed so as to keep up with cruisers. In any event, all of these design choices led the Navy to a compromise. Two 20,000 ton, give or take, carriers, and a repeat Ranger that never came into being. Wasp, the eventual user of that spare tonnage, was more a mini Yorktown than any sort of repeat Ranger. Even once this was decided upon, though, the design process remained a mess of competing ideas. Different ideas about how fast the carrier should go, Arguments about if she should be a flush deck design or have an island. Ranger's design history echoes here. This would be won out by the island option, though, mostly for reasons of smoke dispersal from her power plant. Further arguments about protection, if it should be full anti-torpedo defense and defense against in and shell fire, and defense against bombs, raged on. And yet further arguments about how heavy her defensive firepower should be were also included. Yorktown went through quite a few twists and turns to reach her final design, including attempts, once again, to ape the British and Japanese and build a carrier with two flight decks. This was dropped relatively quickly, luckily, though its legacy would remain in one of the more interesting features of Yorktown, a hangar deck catapult. This would prove to be rarely used in practice, being of very limited utility in actual service. It's probably telling that it was removed from the surviving sisters in mid-1942. Though I think my favorite proto-Yorktown is probably Scheme J, the one with three triple 8-inch gun turrets mounted in front of a shortened flight deck. Do I think this was all a good idea? No, not at all. 
But it's one of those wacky 1930s carrier ideas that are just hilarious to imagine actually seeing. The actual final design that came out of this process would, in the end, be what modern eyes would consider a fairly normal carrier design. Really, though, this is because Yorktown's design would be so influential that she shaped the modern conception of a World War II aircraft carrier. Yorktown's design, scaled up and improved upon, would be the basis for the Essex class, after all. And they served right up through the early 90s, albeit in secondary roles. For her own part, Yorktown came out as a 20,000 ton carrier in standard loading, going up to about 25 to 26,000 tons fully loaded. With a length of 824 feet, 251 meters, and a beam of 83 feet, 25 meters at the waterline, she was a decently wide ship as well, especially as her flight deck was 109 feet, 33 meters wide. This hull was powered by nine boilers, generating 120,000 shaft horsepower. This could get Yorktown up to 32.5 knots, which while not quite up to the Lexington standard, is still pretty fast by carrier standards. Carrying 90 aircraft on average, though this could change depending on spares or operational needs, the Yorktown still held to the American desire to get as many planes per flight deck as possible. This was largely possible because of their open hangars and the tall height of those spaces, allowing for the typically American storage of spares in the rafters. As for defense, the ships had a 4-inch belt at its thickest, this roughly intended for resisting 6-inch shell fire. Her defensive firepower then consisted at launch of 8 5-inch 38 caliber guns mounted along her flight deck. This was further reinforced by the then new 1.1 inch guns and 24 50 caliber machine guns. Those would eventually be replaced, in order, by 40 mm Bofors and 20 mm cannon on the surviving sisters. Three ships would be built to the Yorktown design, with Wasp built to a downsized variant to use up spare tonnage. The first two were Yorktown herself and the far more famous Enterprise. When the Washington Treaty restrictions were lifted, a third sister, or fourth depending on how one views Wasp, was authorized to a slightly updated design. This would become USS Hornet, a short-lived but exciting ship. She was built largely to get another ship in the water, while what would become the Essex class was finalized for construction. With Yorktown's design out of the way, we can get into her service history now. This is the really fun part. Laid down on May 21st, 1934, Yorktown would be constructed right next to her sister Enterprise. I'll put a picture here for illustration purposes. It is incredibly rare to see two capital ships built side by side like this, as one could expect, so it's an interesting thing to look at. Yorktown would be completed first though, launching on April 4th, 1936. Following this, she would be commissioned on September 30th, 1937, and entered the fleet. With only a couple years before war would break out, Yorktown didn't see much in the way of pre-war service. As such, I'm going to mostly gloss over this, since it really is much of the usual for this period. Flea problems and other training exercises and the like. One distinction for Yorktown here, though, is that while most of the fleet remained in the Pacific in light of rising tensions with Japan, Yorktown would actually be sent to the Atlantic for a few months in 1941. Here she would be part of the undeclared war with Germany, providing convoy escort duties akin to what Ranger and Wasp were doing. There were a couple exciting moments with potential U-boats, and of course the sinking of the USS Reuben James, but these were, by and large, the exception to the rule. Yorktown would be lucky, insofar as she was in the Atlantic when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. With a sudden need for striking power, and the power of the aircraft carriers on the offensive brutally proven to be important, Yorktown was immediately sent to join Enterprise and the Lexingtons in the Pacific. As a fully capable carrier, she was not going to be held back on lighter duty like Ranger or Wasp. Her early service in the Pacific was nothing of real note, though. She participated, alongside her sister, in reinforcing island bases, before splitting off to raid the Gilbert and Marshall Islands. These raids were retaliatory strikes, really, intended to do less notable damage, and more to say to the Japanese, we're still here, we can still hit you like you hit us. In this, Yorktown and her pilots acquitted themselves well. She suffered no real losses to her air wing, her pilots gained valuable experience, and the ship slipped away with no real damage to herself. After a short stint in Pearl Harbor for supplies, though, 
we get to the more interesting part of her service. Yorktown departed Pearl Harbor on February 14, 1942, setting off to join USS Lexington in the Coral Sea. This is not the battle they're in, though. First, the two carriers would launch a daring strike raid on Japanese landings on New Guinea. Over 100 planes between the flat tops would fly through the treacherous Owen Stanley Mountains to hit the Japanese. While this was not as successful as it could have been, many of these pilots were still pretty green, and the issue with American torpedoes was quickly becoming apparent. It was still a successful raid. Only one of the planes was lost, and the experience the pilots gained would prove to be very helpful later on. Following a period of little action and a short refit in the less-than-ideal Tonga Islands, Yorktown would be back to sea in the Coral Sea in late April. Joining back up with Lexington, the two carriers would continue to strike the Japanese in the lead-up to the Battle of the Coral Sea. It was early reports of this operation that had prompted Yorktown, tired and overworked, back to sea in the first place. After striking Japanese forces in Tulagi, she would sail with Lexington into the proper Battle of the Coral Sea in early May. As with the Lexington video, I'll note that I'm going to do a dedicated video on this battle at a later date, so I'm only going to cover directly related to Yorktown events here. First, her pilots would, alongside Lexington's, sink the Japanese light carrier Shoho. Then her wildcats would drive off Japanese scouts. This is pretty standard, but then you get into the evening of May 7th, where somehow, no fewer than six Japanese planes and their pilots attempted to land on Yorktown. Somehow, some way, these six men managed to confuse Yorktown with the Shokaku sisters. Understandably, the Americans took offense to this, and gunfire drove the Japanese planes off. Only one of the six would be shot down, though, in an ominous indication of how things would go later on. For on the next day, the climax of the battle began. First, Yorktown's dive bombers would put two bombs into Shokaku. This, coupled with damage from Lexington's flyers, would put that carrier out of commission for some time. Unfortunately for the American carriers, the Japanese launched their own attack, and it would do rather more substantial damage. Lexington, of course, took the brunt of the damage, as I went over in her own video. Yorktown, in spite of dodging eight torpedoes and most of the bombs dropped on her, would not entirely escape damage of her own. A single bomb from a Val dive bomber pierced her flight deck, exploding below decks. The explosion would kill or wound some 66 men, while also doing some pretty severe damage to her power plant. This explosion, and 12 near misses under the waterline, caused severe enough damage that, after Lexington was lost and the battle was ended, it was estimated that Yorktown would need anywhere from two weeks to three months to be put into proper fighting shape. As anyone who has watched anything on the Battle of Midway could tell you, though, three months was not available. In spite of being blunted in their advance and being down two carriers, mostly due to dumb decisions in regards to not combining air wings to get Suikaku in service, the Japanese weren't slowing down at all. The cryptid signals intelligence gave away Yamamoto's trap at Midway, and the USN could only muster two undamaged carriers, Enterprise and Hornet, against four Japanese ships. Yorktown, damaged or not, was needed. As such, after pulling into Pearl Harbor, a truly Herculean effort by dock workers got her into somewhat operable condition in just two days. This consisted of fixing her flight deck, luckily her elevators were undamaged, and patching the hull damage from the near misses. It would not, however, fix her power plant issues, lowering her speed in the coming battle. This is still an impressive feat of engineering, all told, since while Yorktown steamed into battle with patch job repairs, she still steamed into battle nonetheless. Her air wing, wary and battle-worn, would be reinforced by many of Saratoga's planes and flyers for the battle. That recently refit carrier was speeding towards Hawaii as fast as she could, but she wouldn't make it in time for Midway, so she was there spiritually instead, through her air wing joined with Yorktown's. One could say that Yorktown's air wing was every bit as patchwork as her hull in the upcoming battle. Just like with Coral Sea, though, I'm not going to go into great detail on Midway. I will cover only Yorktown's role, which is quite enough for this video. Yorktown would, after all, play a central role in the battle, both to the benefit of the American cause and to her own misfortune.
First, her brave torpedo planes would be mauled hitting the Japanese carriers, or attempting to, at any rate. It's well recorded that none of these torpedoes would do any damage to the Japanese ships. It is equally as well recorded that the massacre of the Devastators drew enough attention that the Dauntless dive bombers would, relatively unopposed, drop out of the sky and hammer the Japanese fleet. Hitting carriers with fully fueled and armed planes on their decks, Enterprise and Yorktown's pilots would wreck three of the four carriers. Yorktown's flyers, in particular, hit Soryu with three bombs. This would cause such severe damage and fires that the carrier was basically instantly taken out of the battle and mortally wounded. The fourth carrier, however, was still at large. Hiryu, separated from the rest of the Japanese fleet, would send out a retaliatory strike that found Yorktown. Eighteen Vals attacked the carrier, and in spite of her combat air patrol's best efforts, and those of her anti-aircraft gunners, Yorktown would be hit by three bombs and one crashing plane. The damage done by two of the bombs and the plane was relatively minor, in large part due to the efforts of her damage control and lessons learned from the loss of Lexington. There would be no fuel explosions here. However, the second bomb to hit her did much more severe damage. That bomb disabled her already damaged and not yet repaired power plant. Yorktown would first slow to six knots, then come to a complete stop. This would have been a death sentence were the Japanese in any condition to send a follow-on attack quickly. That one had happened. Yorktown's damage control teams managed, miraculously, to get her underway again at around 20 knots just a couple hours later. This would thoroughly confuse the oncoming Japanese, who were entirely convinced they were hitting an undamaged carrier. Unfortunately for Yorktown, she was damaged. There would be no repeat of her torpedo dodging feat at Coral Sea here. 18 Kate torpedo bombers would attack her, and in spite of her fighters downing some of them and her own frantic maneuvers, Yorktown would take two torpedo hits in quick succession. These seemingly doomed the ship as her power went out and she began to list drastically to port. By the time her list reached an incredible 26 degrees, her captain ordered her crew to abandon ship. Surely a ship listing to such a degree would soon capsize, after all. When he left the ship himself, water was reportedly lapping at her hangar deck, the list was so severe. And yet, Yorktown didn't capsize. She remained afloat, if tilted at a crazy angle, right on through the night. With the coming of the morning, volunteers returned to their carrier, working to save her. Top weight was lessened by throwing overboard planes and 5-inch guns. Her list was lowered by 2 degrees, with power and pumping provided by the destroyer Hammond. It seemed that, in spite of damage that would sink a lesser ship, Yorktown was going to survive. She was going to start the reputation of her class to survive insane levels of damage. It wasn't meant to be, though. In spite of multiple destroyers being on anti-submarine duty, including Monaghan, I-168 managed to sneak into a perfect firing position. Four torpedoes were launched at the carrier. One would slam into Hammond, breaking her back and sinking her quickly. Two would hit Yorktown, further damaging an already damaged ship. The fourth would, mercifully, miss to her stern. Coupled with an underwater explosion a minute after Hammond sank, most likely her depth charge is going off, your town was mortally wounded by these hits. While there were plans to attempt a second salvage operation, Yorktown would finally roll over completely and sink the next day. As a result, Yorktown would, ultimately, have the shortest wartime career of her class. Yet, she endured terrific poundings. She served valiantly, her pilots, alongside those loaned by Saratoga, sinking one of the Japanese Kido Butai, after her pilots had already damaged another one. If Yorktown had a short career, it can't be called a boring one. And who knows, if I-168 had missed Yorktown, she might well have made it back to Pearl Harbor. Unsinkable Yorktown has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? But that's for another day and another video. Here, Yorktown's story ends. She would be succeeded by an Essex-class carrier, CV-10, which is still afloat as a museum ship to this day alongside the similarly legacy-named Hornet CV-12 and Lexington CV-16. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.